It's time to get inside the Giants huddle. Huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. On Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to another edition of the Giants huddle podcast. My name is John Schmelk. Happy holidays, everybody. It's all brought to you by PSE&G. Energy efficiency for game time and any time. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. All right, we got our normal end-of-week pregame podcast first. A lengthy conversation with Giants rookie edge rusher Kayvon Thibodeau. He sits down with me. Then Lance Meadow and Paul Dettino have a chance to talk to Matthew Collar, who covers the Vikings for Purple Insider. And finally, Bob Papa with his weekly conversation with Giants head coach Brian Dable. All right, everybody. Thanks for being with us. Remember, go back, listen to some of our past episodes. Bob Papa with Kerry Collins this week. Um, the Giants NFC Championship game win against the Vikings. Uh, really fun episode there. And we also launched a new draft season episode this week. So go search for draft season on your favorite podcast platform. Subscribe to it. And uh, check out Tony, Pauline, and I as we take a deeper look at some of the college players that might be of interest to the Giants and other NFL teams in the draft in 2022. 2023, sorry. Wow, I'm already behind. All right, let, let's get to it. One guy that hasn't been behind the last few weeks is Giants rookie edge rusher Kayvon Thibodeau playing some of his best football. Let's take a listen to my conversation with him. Kayvon, man, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good. How are you? Doing fantastic. Let's talk about this first. Defensive player of the week. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah, it's been a blessing, man. It's been a long time coming. So now that it's finally got, you know, the, the recognition, it feels good. Yeah, and look, you had the big play last week, obviously, the sack. Can you take us through that pass rush move? Looked like you did a little speed to power, huh? Yeah, it was, it was definitely some speed to power, and then I, I know like a lot of tackles are, are a lot stronger than I am, so just me being able to come off of it quick and use my speed to my advantage. And it looks like you got your hands inside, too, right? How much are you learning that's such a key here to kind of win that inside hand against these tackles? I mean, it always is. That's been a, a, a trait you know, that you've needed since football, so just always being that guy with your hands inside will give you that advantage in a rush. Your production has popped up over the last month. That doesn't always necessarily indicate that the player feels like they're playing better. But do you feel like you're taking a step here in the last month or so with the way you're playing? I mean, I have definitely feel like I've been playing pretty well. But, yeah, it always feels good when you can actually record the stats and, you know, you, you can see it on the stat sheet. You know, I wonder about your psychological approach to the game because I think you, I like the way you talk about the game, right? And you, and you kind of just mentioned in that answer. Getting a sack has a lot more to do with what's going on around you than it has to do with you. So how do you approach kind of evaluating how you're playing, even when maybe it's not showing up on the stat sheet sometimes? I think just winning your one-on-ones. You know, in a, in a great sport like we play, it's a, it's a team-led sport. So it's like you can't, you know, win the game by yourself, but you can definitely contribute to a win by winning your reps versus the guy in front of you. So that's probably what I try to focus on the most. Yeah, and when you were asked about last week, you went out of your way to, to credit your teammates and your fellow pass rushers up front. And you talk about how you guys complement each other. Can you talk about how you guys do actually complement each other out there? I mean, if you just look at the different sizes and different speeds and the different ways we play, you know, even just start on the edges, me and Aziz, right? We're two great pass rushers, but have two two totally different games. You know, I'm more high wired and he's more finesse and it, it just looks He's just more sound. It looks kind of like ballet, right? Mine is kind of wild and, and, and fiery, and his is more like, it's more of art. So um, I'd say, you know, a lot. there's a lot of different ways. Just if you watch the film, you know, you can see there's times where um, he kind of sets that edge where the quarterback has nowhere to run, and I come around for the sack, or I do the same, set that edge, and the quarterback scrambles, and then you got Leo and Dex on the inside, and then you got even guys like Ryder Anderson stepping up and making plays, uh, you know, on that second effort rushes. What do you think you've been doing better the last month or so where you've been able to kind of, you know, have your play turn into more numbers? Uh, just discipline, you know, being more disciplined and taking that extra effort that, you know, not only doing your job is good, but, you know, making that play is what people are going to remember in this uh, time of the year. Tell me if I'm wrong. I felt like after you had the MCL injury and you came back, I didn't think I saw the same burst and get off off the line that I saw when I was watching you up close on the practice field and during training camp. But I feel like once the brace came off in the last month that – the same Kayvon I saw in the summer in terms of burst is back. Did you sense a steady improvement from that knee, or am I seeing things? I, I mean, I would definitely say I don't think it's so much played to the to like my health, but I think it played more to my feel for the game and just understanding, you know, being more confident when I line up, knowing that you know I have the tools and I'm equipped. Um, in my preparation, right, to, to execute the defense. So, yeah, I would say it definitely has grown over the past uh, month, but I would say I credit it more to uh, my mental than I do my actual physical. 
Interesting. So is it kind of just feel for the type of players you're playing and what it takes to succeed in the NFL? Is it you improving your technique? Is it a combination? Uh, I would say it's definitely a combination, but, you know, because uh, these teams are so well coached and these players are so great, it's definitely on the players and me uh, getting adjusted to, you know, the different um, formations, the different uh, game plans, sure. schemes that, you know, we'll face, and then how can I complement, you know, what I do, right, with my own team, right, and making sure that I can execute, you know, uh, on the different plays that we call. And one thing you talked a lot about since you got here is getting your head in the playbook and learning the scheme. How has the comfort level in what Wink wants you to do out there also helped contribute to it? Uh, just understanding how the defensive coordinator thinks and what he sees. You know, they call plays and and, and they have a, a outcome in their mind on what you know each play is going to bring. So if I can learn that and see it from that perspective and know um, what an opponent would, what are they looking at, right? When and I know that we're giving up what we're giving up sure. and kind of playing to that tell. So, yeah, it definitely is like a chess game. And it's, um, you know, I always tell guys, like, when you are a great player, you got to just kind of shoot your gun sometime and, and go play. Yeah, you know, last week you beat the offensive tackle one on one, but you go back a couple games ago, the first game against Washington, Wink was getting you one on one with tight ends, right? He was getting you free free runs. How does his scheme really help you show what you can do to kind of get those really good matchups? I would say it's funny, you know, because you do get you know different matchups, but it also creates a um, more more responsibility on you to understand who's going to block you, right? Sure. Because there are certain instances where, you know, you line up and you're expecting somebody to block you, but because of the call that the coach has made and what the offense sees, you know, that guy that you're expecting to block you might not block you. So that's that's a, a test of what, too, I say, you know, understanding the game and knowing, like, okay, when the team sees, you know, the zero look, this is the protection they're going to go, and then understanding how to use my rush off of that. But, yeah, I've been I've definitely been putting it together a lot more, and now it's just going to continue, you know, try to continue that pace. So it's funny, I talked to Aziz about this last week, and he talked about how he has different pass rush plans based on guard, tackle, back, tight end. So when that other guy that maybe you're not expecting then is going to block you, you kind of have to change what you want to do on the fly a little bit? Uh, exactly, and that's when your counter moves come, that's when your second effort rushes, and that's when your team and, and all those other four guys, that's when they come in handy and kind of show up the most because, you know, you can't. There's no guy who can win every rush, right? So the times where you do get stuck or you do have to have that second effort, you got th- your other three guys that are rushing, other four guys um, that are going to help you to keep that quarterback contained. And you know, we're talking pass rush, but I thought you know maybe the most impressive part of your game last week was your job you did against the run. A couple of those read options, they try to put you in those tough. This spots where you got to make a quick decision, right? And for the most part, I know there's maybe one or two you want back, but for the most part, you made really good decisions. How do you think you're coming along in terms of that aspect of your game? Uh, I think that's just confidence. That's watching plays, uh, knowing the personnel, knowing who you're going against, and um, making having to make those decisions. And I think you know the great the greatest thing about the game is that you know you, you don't always get an opportunity to make the play, but um, you know when you when you live right and you do things the right way, um, you you kind of get those opportunities back. So yeah, you're right. There were some plays I left out there, but it, it creates that. You know, it, it won't happen again. Type feeling. Do you enjoy playing coverage? Uh, definitely. You know, when you can you, you can get out and, and a quarterback looks at you and he doesn't want to throw the ball and then someone else sacks him, it feels good. You still you know play a role in that. No question about it. You were very prepared coming in to to be a professional. You spoke about it all off season. So I'm not going to use the word surprise. But is anything that you've experienced in the NFL been maybe a little bit different than what you expected yeah. coming in? Uh, I would definitely say you know just the. Um, the consistent rehab, the consistent cycle of being prepared. You know, at this point in the year, the best ability is availability, right? So just making sure that you're healthy enough to go and that you have the, the power to, to sustain and the power to execute. Is your body yelling at you? Yo, dude, you should have played your bowl game already. This season's supposed to be over. <laughs> this is a lot of games. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, it, my body does definitely feel different, but I think, you know, I I thank myself and my team that I have around me that, you know, help me take care of my body and, and show me years ago how important it was going to be. So I've been able to kind of stay on a routine this whole season. And even the vets, they've helped me out in my routine. And, you know, I've been good so far. And I got to imagine, you know, playing all these meaningful games late adds a little bit extra juice to making sure you are ready, right? Exactly, exactly. It's all mental. If you don't mind, it don't matter. <laughs> and finally, um, before we get to the opponent, how is you? How have you guys handled the – Stress is maybe the wrong word, but the added intensity of these late games. I think Brian Dable does a great job of, you know, every week's the same. Every game's important. You go out there, you play, you win no matter what. But, you know, last week put you in great playoff position. Now you have a chance to clinch this week. Does that stuff ever even enter your mind, or do you stay disciplined enough where you're just worried about the opponent that's on the field? It sounds funny, but I almost say it's not real. 
right? And I say that because you could go and say like, okay, you know, we won uh, ten games and now we're in the playoffs, and it's like you, you coast and you go to the playoffs and you lose the first round. Right. You know, you're it's like so all for nothing, right? So I would say, you know, you try not to get caught up in it, and and in reality, it's the NFL, so anybody can can win. Right, so you just try to keep that mindset and continue to to harp on what got you there, right? Because everybody always says, you know, we we harp on the goal and everybody wants the Super Bowl, but the process is is what got you there. So just focusing on that and, and um, staying humble in it. I asked about your run defense, and it's going to be tested this week. The Vikings love to run that outside zone, man. They're going to run that outside zone with Dalvin Cook right at you, right at Aziz. What are some of the things you guys have to do to to make sure Dalvin Cook doesn't get in the space? Because, you know, once he's in the open field and running, nobody's catching that dude. Yeah, we got to set the edge and we got to hit him. I think, you know, once uh, back takes a lot of hits, they start to run different. So I think that'll be, you know, a point of emphasis for me, a point of emphasis for uh, the D-line and continuing just to be stout up front. And you guys consider it a team effort to slow down a guy like Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen? It always is. You know, when you this is the NFL, right? Everybody, everybody's gonna make plays, but I think the team is always gonna um, arise over those individuals. So just uh, continuing to to play team ball it will help you succeed in the end. Finally, I know every week you take a deep look at the tackles you're facing. You got Christian Darris, who was playing like one of the best offensive tackles in the league. Brian O'Neill, who nobody talks about, was a early round pick a couple years ago. He's playing well. What is it about these tackles that they do well? Um, yeah, man, they're strong. They're physical. You know, they anchor really well. Not too many guys can you know beat them around the edge. Um, and they're they're consistent. They're relentless. You know, they go four quarters. Not not a lot of tackles can't you know sustain through through sixty minutes. And seeing those guys play, they play hard. Merry Christmas. Good luck. Hopefully you come home with a nice win for as a, as a Christmas present. Uh, thank you. Happy holidays. Thanks, Kayvon. Hey, Giant fans, don't miss out on Giants football at MetLife Stadium this season. Limited tickets are still available for the remaining home game. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to find your game and secure your seat. Giants' last home game, Indianapolis Colts, New Year's Day. Celebrate the new year with the New York football Giants. All right, we thank Kayvon Thibodeau for the time. Great, fun conversation with him, getting to know him a little bit. Now let's head over to our opponent preview. Matthew Collar covers the Vikings for Purple Insider. Lance Meadow and Paul Dottino had a chance to talk to him. Giants visit the NFC North champion Vikings this Saturday. First meeting for these teams since 2019 as the Giants wrap up a two-game road trip. And to get more into Minnesota, we're now joined by Matthew Collar, who covers the team for Purple Insider. Matthew, you got Lance Meadow and Paul Dottino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time today. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? Uh, well, I'm indoors, so everything is okay. Uh, but uh, my drive back and forth to the Vikings facility this week was a little uh, dodgy, I would say. The roads are iced over. It's five below. And uh, this morning I had to do the the snow shoveling for the household. So, uh you know, I'm looking forward to being inside for this football game. And I think the Giants and the Vikings players would probably echo your sentiments. Thankfully, U.S. Bank Stadium is an indoor facility, unlike when they met a few years back at the University of Minnesota. It was a completely different story. Speaking of similarities, Matthew, that's where I want to start because I think it's amazing. The Vikings have won 10 games that have been decided by one score. The Giants are right behind them in the NFL archives and standings with respect to eight wins that have been decided by one score. Vikings also only have a point differential of plus two. What has been the biggest difference maker in terms of them being able to close out so many of these close affairs this season? Yeah, no, it is a similarity between these two teams that the outside world keeps looking at both of them and going, how? <laughs> how are you guys doing this uh, each week? And, you know, even last week when the Vikings were down 33 points, uh, I was not ready to just uh, go start eating press box food or something. I mean, because this team has just proven that no deficit is too big. I mean, we talk about the outdoor weather this Vikings team was down 17 points in Buffalo and it was snowing and they found a way to come back. I mean, I think it's a, a bunch of different factors. Number one, if you're an opposing team and you get a lead on the Vikings and you try to sit on that lead, well, they have this guy named Justin Jefferson who can completely take over a game. Um, last week, it was more of you know everybody getting involved. Delvin Cook in the passing game with a 64-yard touchdown. Uh, K.J. Osborne had a career day. Uh, I think that that's a big part of it is that this offense is very boom or bust. And if you end up on the wrong side of that as an opponent, they can rack up points very quickly. But you look at 
their scoring percentage, the percentage of drives in which they score, it's not really that impressive. It's more mid pack. So that they play in a lot of these games where one quarter they'll look like the Super Bowl champs and the next quarter they'll look like a team that doesn't even belong in the playoffs. And there's just no better defining game than last week against the Indianapolis Colts. So I think that that plays into it, that they have enough star power to come through at the biggest moments. Patrick Peterson, future Hall of Famer, getting interceptions or Daniil Hunter, pro bowlers or like, uh, you know, Zadarius Smith, Eric Kendricks, those guys that will come up with big plays and, and Jefferson on the offensive side, but they also have enough enough weaknesses the interior of their offensive line that allows a ton of pressure Kirk Cousins has been sacked 40 times this year uh their cornerback group has been uh highly questionable and has given up a lot of huge days to even not great quarterbacks so I think that they have just enough excellence uh to to keep them in games and win at the end which great players do and just enough flaws to be in some games against teams like say, you know, the Indianapolis Colts that they should have probably just blown out from the outset of that game. Matthew, let me continue with a big picture here. Um, they come off a historic win, greatest comeback ever in NFL history. We all know about what happened with the Colts game last week. But I saw where Coach Kevin O'Connell was talking about how he does not want to trip up and fall to the third seed. It's critical for him that he's no worse than the second seed. Yet, he also talked about having some veterans that are kind of banged up and he's going to be looking at snap counts. So what is the approach of the coach and of the players in the locker room as they face this Giants team, which quite frankly is still trying to lock up a playoff spot? Yeah, uh, that was interesting to hear Kevin O'Connell talk that way because it was sort of like his internal dialogue that he was just going through with us, the debate over whether to give some rest to certain players. I mean, Adam Thielen, for example, has been banged up over the last couple of weeks with a knee issue. I mean, do you take him out and give some more work to somebody else? But it's not like this team really has other wide receivers. You saw they tried to target a couple of times last week, Jalen Rager, and those passes turned into interceptions for Kirk Cousins. And those they both kind of looked like they were on the wide receiver. So they don't really have a lot of depth there. And someone like Zadarius Smith or Daniil Hunter that's been banged up a little bit throughout the season, those guys have played through it. Um, but if you don't play them and you you take them off the field, the backup pass rushers are really not all that effective. This is not a team with a ton of depth across the roster and against the Giants team that, yes, people are asking questions about how good they really are, but they have a ton of very talented players too. And, you know, this Vikings team, if you're playing close with everyone and you say rest a handful of players, even for a few snaps, that's how thin this roster is. You could see them losing one of these next three games just based on how close everything seems to go. But at the same time, I mean, having the divisional round at home is a pretty huge deal. I mean, uh, you, you guys, I mean, know about, you know, the road advantage or the home field advantage and things like that. But I feel like it's even exaggerated when it comes to U.S. Bank Stadium because of the noise in this place. Uh, I think it's one of the most intimidating places in the NFL for an opposing team to have to come, especially in a playoff atmosphere. So that's really important. But you also can't get to the second round unless you win in the first round. And if Christian Derisaw, who's been hurt, or Thielen or Jefferson, I mean, the Jefferson's been taking big hits. The last couple of weeks, uh, there were, uh, I think, what, three different flags in the last two weeks just based on hits against Justin Jefferson, including one in the head from Stephon Gilmore. If Jefferson were to go down, it's, you're just going to lose. You're not beating anyone without Justin Jefferson the way this team is constructed. So I, I think that that choice is very difficult. But for this game specifically, uh, I think everybody's going to be all in. I, I think they're just going to play everybody that they possibly can all the way to try to get a win. And then they'll be able to decide a little closer, okay, you know, if you win here, then do you fight for that two seed? But if they don't win here and the giant, or I'm sorry, and the 49ers win, well, then it might be really hard to get that number two seed. So I, I think for this one, it won't be that relevant, but it might be for week 17 and 18. Matthew, you brought up Justin Jefferson and it was interesting. You were talking about the physicality he's been facing. I heard the other day he was comparing himself to the bad boy Pistons, Michael Jordan Bulls rivalries and how they're taking maybe some cheap shots on him like, Rick Mahorn and the bad boys Pistons. So if that doesn't put it in perspective, I don't know what does. But in all seriousness, we've seen he's cut from a different cloth. So, I mean, I'm not interested to hear your breakdown of what makes him so unique. I think that's been well documented. We know 
his catch radius, his ability to make ridiculous contested catches is crazy. What I'm curious about is the Giants are a bit undermanned at corner, especially without a Dory Jackson. Who, if anyone, you thought this season had success in containing Jefferson? And if so, what did they do so effectively that maybe the Giants could try to take a page at it? Yeah, I know. If uh, also, I mean, Justin Jefferson, I think is 23. So him shouting out uh, back to late eighties <laughs> NBA, like that's striking in, in, in my ballpark there. Uh, if he had, if he had compared himself to Anthony Mason or something, then we would have really been on, but uh, you know, I, well, at least he has proper perspective, bringing up the greatest player of all time in Michael Jordan, but go ahead. Right. Yes. Right. Well, you know, Justin has been like Michael Jordan for this team this year, because there, there is almost no stopping him. I mean, there's only, there's really only one way to stop Justin Jefferson. That is to sack Kirk cousins and cousins has, uh, is going to surpass his highest total of sacks for his career in a single season. I think his previous high is 41. He's got 40 right now. And with the Giants defensive line playing the way it is, I would guarantee at least a couple of sacks. It's really consistent pressure and putting them in situations where they have to play from far behind the sticks that just makes it difficult to ride with Justin Jefferson all the time or for him to push the ball down the field. To Justin Jefferson. I don't believe there's a cornerback in the game who could stop him. Uh, we saw last year uh, Jalen Ramsey went one on one with Jefferson. He did have a game earlier this year. I think it was maybe week three against Detroit where Jeff Akuda had a really good day against him. But since then, that's really been the only one. Uh, Darius Slay um, against Philadelphia did pick off Kirk Cousins a couple times. But aside from that, I mean, it's usually just been. Can you pressure the quarterback? Can you make it very difficult for Kirk Cousins to step back and find Justin Jefferson and get a throw off? Because anything that comes his way, he's going to catch. The amazing thing about him, though, is, you know, you bring up Jordan and for guys like us comparing Jordan to anyone is just like, OK, don't do that. Like, that's the go. <laughs> but in terms of competitiveness, Justin Jefferson has that Jordan in him. Like he competes all practice all game, all the time. And when the football's in the air, he's going to fight for it. So if Cousins can even get it toward him, he's going to make a play on it. And if you're throwing out backup cornerbacks against him, it's going to be even more difficult. But if you're talking about Dexter Lawrence or Kayvon Thibodeau, you get a strip sack in there, you hit Kirk Cousins a few times. I mean, we've seen Jefferson not really get slowed down for slowed down for full games but more like halves of games. And, you know, you go back and look at Miami, how much they pressured him or Washington, how much they pressured cousins up the middle uh, where it wasn't until late in the game until Jefferson actually got going. So that's really the only plan because the teams have double teamed him. They've played zone coverages. They've played press coverages. They've tried hitting him in the face. They've tried anything they possibly can. And this man truly cannot be stopped. You know, it, it kind of brings up a, a, an old game plan that Belichick used for the Giants against Jim Kelly's Bills in Super Bowl Twenty Five, and that was go ahead, let Thurman Thomas run for 100 yards. In this case, it would be Dalvin Cook. That's fine. We're going to pressure the quarterback and beat the stuffing out of the receivers every chance we get to throw off that passing game because that is more explosive and more dangerous than even having a running back run for 100 yards. Might that be a good philosophy for the Giants. Well, I'm glad you brought that up since I grew up in Buffalo, actually. And uh, I remember that Super Bowl quite well. I just want to know how Jeff Hostetler held on to the ball when Bruce Smith sacked him in the end zone. But that's for crazy the, uh, glue. That's I, yeah, I don't I still don't understand that. But uh, or, uh, hey, if the Bills play a little more aggressively at the end, maybe it's not a 47 yard field goal. I'm just saying. But uh, that aside, um, can you tell, can you tell when I grew up by the way, by this show, uh, <laughs> from the, from the it's early a full 90s breakdown of the 1990s on this program, apparently <laughs> that's right. Well, you know what? Hey, uh, Otis Anderson had his day too. So anyway, but, um, you know, when it comes to the game plan, I think that one thing we've seen Kirk cousins struggle with at times is holding on to the ball a little too long. And when defenses show him lots of different looks, and this is why I think it's such a great challenge for the Vikings against the Wink Martindale defense, because there's going to be a lot of looks. And this is the first year where I've really seen Cousins struggle against the Blitz. And I think part of it is learning a new offense. He was in that Stefanski and Gary Kubiak offense for several seasons, and it seemed like he really 
understood exactly where he had to go with the football when he got a look that he didn't really recognize. But this year, there's just been a lot more ups and downs for Cousins from that perspective. And when you look at his numbers against the Blitz, I mean, they just simply have not been that good. And that goes toward the other way to slow down Justin Jefferson, which is just to confuse Kirk Cousins. And I remember there was some stat because we have a stat for absolutely everything, but about quarterbacks and how they perform when the defense shows them something post-snap than what it looked like pre-snap. And Cousins was very much in the middle of the league. I think he's a li- he's a guy that likes to totally understand what he's going to do before the snap and then execute that, not have to figure it out on the fly because it's not like he could take off running. He's not a Jeff Hostler uh, level athlete. If you remember, he used to be on special teams, things like that. So um, he's not like that. He's not going to escape. He's not going to run out of the pocket. So he has to see it first. And if you can confuse him a little bit, you could slow down this Vikings offense. You know, what's interesting, Matthew, Dallas, Washington, and Philadelphia, are the only three teams this year, all in the NFC East, that have held this Vikings offense under 21 points. Hmm. Is, is that the similar characteristic that all three of those games show? I think it's really defensive lines. I mean, because you go back to those games, Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne annihilated the interior of the Vikings offensive line. And it's it's a weak interior. They're going to be playing a backup center in Austin Schlotman. Uh, their right guard has allowed more pressures according to PFF, than anybody in the league. And that certainly matches up with the eye test from what I've seen. And their left guard, Ezra Cleveland, is very up and down. He's a great athlete, but sometimes uh, has tough days in there. So the tackles the tackles are so good, Brian O'Neill and Christian Derrissaw, that a lot of the pressure doesn't come from there. Um, but when Micah Parsons dominated the game, Christian Derrissaw left early with a concussion. So every one of those games has been, and of course, Philadelphia, you know about their defensive line as well. Every one of those games has been that same trend. And that's why as we're previewing this game and talking about this matchup, that is the one thing that gives me hesitation in terms of picking the Vikings to win because of somebody like Dexter Lawrence, because he can dominate the middle. I mean, him going up against a backup center, a right guard that's inexperienced with a lot of blitzes and things like that. That is a big advantage for the Giants, I think. We're talking with Matthew Collar, who covers the Vikings for Purple Insider. Matthew, we were talking about Dalvin Cook earlier, and maybe the philosophy for the Giants is, hey, let him run. But the truth be told, you look at the statistics this season, the Vikings are 28th. They're only averaging 95 rushing yards per game. I know Cook has gone over 1,000, and he's been effective on the outside. Really a two-part question for you. A, do you think they've run the ball enough, given all the weapons they have in the passing attack? And B, How would you best assess Cook's season, even though the numbers don't necessarily jump off the page? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because with Delvin Cook, we've seen when he's up to full speed, when he gets out in space, that he's as fast as ever. He had an 81-yard touchdown against the Buffalo Bills where he was shot out of a cannon, and then you saw the 64-yard touchdown that uh, tied the game against the Colts last week. But I I also think that there's just something naturally that happens to running backs in their mid to late 20s where that first-step burst isn't quite the same as it used to be. And there are times where Delvin is caught in the backfield or he's getting to an edge and doesn't get around the corner where I've said to other reporters in the press box, like, I think he's going to the house a couple of years ago with that. So there may be just a little bit of that aging process that's gone on. But I also think that this is Kevin O'Connell's offense. Like Kevin O'Connell wants to be pass first. He wants to put it on Kirk Cousins' shoulders and throw the ball to Jefferson and things like that. And I think that the running is sort of a necessity to maybe set up some play actions more than in the past where it was a Gary Kubiak offense. I mean, they were all about run first and then play action off that where I think with Kevin O'Connell, I mean, we looked this up uh, not too long ago uh, that, you know, a second down in 10, Kevin O'Connell is barely ever dialing up a run. Whereas when they're, they're playing for you know, the Kubiaks, it was all the time when it was second down to 10. Now the analytics people don't love that, but they really don't mix it up. And I think that they have become predictable at times throughout the season where you could kind of figure like, okay, first and 10 is about 50, 50, any other down, they're just throwing the ball all the time. And I think it is, is the process of Kevin O'Connell really figuring out 
who he is as a play caller and how to manage those situations as well. Uh, because sometimes it is better to just keep pounding the ball away with Delvin Cook when it's working. But I've felt at times that they've gotten a little anxious, like, oh, well, there was one negative run, so we got to go back and throw, throw, throw. And I think that's led to some of their, uh, uh, you know, maybe up and downs, whereas maybe they were a little more consistent before when running Delvin Cook. So I think he's still got the talent. Um, but he's kind of just relied on to get them a big play here or there. What we saw last week, though, that's worth noting is he was a really involved in the passing game. And so far this year, he just hasn't been a lot. They haven't had success with screens very often. They haven't really lined him up at wide receiver much. And they did that in this last game. And I wonder if that will carry over or if they'll need him in the backfield trying to pick up those Wink Martindale blitzes all day long. I want to ask you about the defense here because I know they do have some quality pass rushing ability. I know that their secondary has a couple of big names, but they play a lot of zone. They play a lot of off coverage. I get all of that. But what about their ability to contain a running quarterback like Daniel Jones? Because the Giants RPO scheme is obviously a big part of what they do. And even if you're able to contain Barkley, Jones has shown the ability to move the ball with his legs. Yeah, that, that's a, an interesting subject because all the running quarterbacks that they've faced so far this year have done a very good job running the ball against them. And, you know, if you look up Justin Fields box score, there's a little misleading part, which is he ran for a 60 yard touchdown against the Vikings that was called back on a senseless block in the back that didn't even matter. So if you include that in our conversation, I mean, they allowed Jalen Hurts to run effectively. Kyler Murray uh, got a bunch of runs against them. And then, you know, Justin Fields as well. You know, so I think that that's something that they do struggle with a bit. I'm just really interested to see how they adjust in general to some of the things that they used last week, because a few weeks ago, I think Kevin O'Connell reached his breaking point with Ed Donatel, the defensive coordinator, playing that off coverage, playing zones, playing too deep. And then suddenly in the second half of that Colts game, we saw Harrison Smith coming up into the box, which he hasn't done this year. I have no idea why, because that's really <laughs> his best thing. Uh, but he was kind of a menace last week against the Colts. He was blitzing. He was changing the coverage at the last second, things like that. Uh, so that's going to that's gonna be a major part of it as well. And then you mentioned that pass rush where Daniel Jones takes his fair share of sacks as well. And Zadarius Smith and Daniil Hunter, they're kind of relied on to be the entire pass rush. But last week, they blitzed a lot against Matt Ryan, which they have not done all year long. Like that was, we were going like, what is going on here? All of a sudden, Ed found his blitz packages, but uh, they were acting like they were Wink Martindale last week. So will they do that again? Or are they going to be afraid to get burned by blitzing and then get, you know, handoffs to Saquon Barkley and big runs off of that or big runs, you know, out of structure by Daniel Jones? So I, I think that is a really interesting matchup of what they're trying to change on defense versus what the uh, Giants do well. Matthew, you reference the tendency for them to give up some big explosive plays over the course of the season. And I think that's partially a product of the secondary. And that's where I want to go to because – Cam Dantzler is on the injury report. He's listed as questionable. He had a stint on IR with the ankle injury. I'm guessing that flared up again, and that's why he's somewhat of a question mark for this weekend. So if they don't have him, how has Duke Shelley held up, assuming he does replace him, and how significant of a loss is that to the secondary? Yeah, I think that the way that Duke Shelley has played versus Cam Dantzler and how they fit in this defense, uh, it's it's actually an upgrade to have Duke Shelley playing. And I wouldn't be surprised if he has another decent game. I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see Cam Dantzler there uh, just in general. I mean, when you take over somebody else's team and you change defensive systems, one of the things is that those players before were drafted to fit the previous guy's system. And Cam Dantzler is very good at playing press man and just tracking guys on routes, but he's not real good at reading and reacting in zones. And we've just seen that a lot. If you, if you look at uh, Jamison Williams touchdown against the Vikings against Detroit, where there was no one around Jamison Williams, it was because Cam Dantzler didn't really understand his assignment, which tends to happen kind of a lot. Duke Shelley is about as scrappy of a player that you are ever going to run across in your life. He weighs about 180 pounds. When he was coming out of high school, his coach told him to start calling D3 teams. And here he is fighting for his job. And you saw it last week. He blew up a couple of pass plays 
Uh, and he's actually second on the team in PBUs despite only playing a handful of games because he's just a very aggressive and scrappy player. And I, it's it sounds weird to say that this guy who is a pretty much unknown player would be you know high, like higher on the list or should be playing or is a better fit over someone like Dantzler. But I, I honestly think that that's the case. And I, I think going into the playoffs, you might see Duke Shelley. And, and, and I actually think it would be a mistake to go back to Dantzler because he's allowed 127 quarterback rating on throws into his coverage where we've seen Duke Shelley be much uh, a much better fit. So I, I consider their defense at this moment to be a fully healthy unit. All right. I, I got to ask you about special teams for a second, because it's very kind to say the Giants special teams have been inconsistent. <laughs> they seem to give up one big kickoff or punt return almost every week. And so far, they've been able to somehow survive it. But I see where the kickoff return unit for the Vikings has been very good this year. And then I also see that their kicker, Joseph, is only two of seven from 50 plus yards on field goals. So I wonder if you could just give us a quick thumbnail as to how you feel special teams for the Vikings might impact a game which many of us think could be very close and come down to the wire. Yeah. Now, last week aside, because they allowed a blocked punt, they had a backup in because someone got hurt and they missed a, a blocking assignment. I think this has been one of the best special teams units that I've covered since I've been here covering the team and is probably one of the best in the league. Um, certainly, Greg Joseph has had his his issues from kicking deep, uh, which fans tell us that we had jinxed him by reporting he was doing really well in training camp. So I apologize <laughs> to the fans for doing that, for that jinx. Uh, but uh, Joseph, I think, has really gotten his confidence up the last couple of weeks. He hit a 50-yarder and then the game winner from last week. It's still a little spotty when it comes to the extra points, but if you guys know how to predict kickers, please let me know because uh, I've seen all sorts of things with this organization and I have <laughs> no way of predicting whether a kicker will be good uh, in a season or a week or anything, but I do know the Vikings have about the best punter I've ever seen in my life. Uh, Ryan Wright kicked a 73 yarder earlier this year. Last week, he pinned the Colts down. I mean, it is a significant advantage. I mean, you go up against Tress Way with Washington Washington, uh, you know, a couple of times a year. I think that Ryan Wright is right there with him. And the kick and punt return units are legitimate threats. There was a silly penalty that called back a long Jalen Rager punt return, but I think he's pretty good at it. But Kenny Wongwu is simply the second best in the league next to Cordero Patterson. He just has a natural ability and a 4-3-40 that you, you don't run into very often. I mean, Dave Maggot would be proud of the way that Kenny Wongwu returns kicks because he is just a special, special talent. So what a lot of teams have been trying to do is – Either, of course, you kick it out of the back of the end zone or since he'll take it deep from the end zone sometimes, try to pin him in the corner. But they've even found their way out of that uh, a lot of times. So that I mean, that is one of the reasons that the Vikings have won all of these one score games that so you go back to. You know, the Patriots game, it's back and forth. The defense was playing horribly. And then all of a sudden, Kenne Wongwu completely changes the game. Or when other teams think they've gotten a key stop against the Vikings from almost anywhere on the field, their punter can get you down uh, inside the 10-yard line and make the other team go 90 yards. So there's been a lot of buzz here for their special teams coordinator, Matt Daniels, as as kind of a, a unique guy that could end up putting his name on the radar for head coaching jobs in the future. That's how impressed uh, we have been here with the special teams. Yeah, Wangwu had that big touchdown against the Patriots on Thanksgiving for 97 yards. So if that didn't put him on the map nationally, then I don't know what would under the circumstances. Matthew, before we let you go, I want to circle back to where we started. Earlier in the conversation, Paul was asking you about the mindset of this Vikings team. And interestingly, if we're to speculate and look ahead, it's possible if the Giants do clinch a playoff spot, maybe both of these teams meet up, right, in the wild card round. And I'm just curious, not that necessarily Kevin O'Connell has revealed this publicly, but your perspective on, A, do you think the Vikings have that in the back of their mind? And would they say to themselves, maybe we need to hold some things back that we could potentially use in a playoff matchup? And B, could they maybe put a little bit more weight in a game like this saying, hey, we don't want to do the Giants any favors. Maybe we can try to eliminate them from the postseason given their upcoming opponents and your reaction to some of those philosophies. Yeah, I, I don't know if I've ever thought that teams have the opportunity to hold things back, right? Like you have to try to, if if you're gunning for the two seed, you have to try to win. And if you say, you know what, we're, we're not going to, you know, do the thing that would 
be best against the Giants, then you're just probably going to lose. So I, I think maybe now Kevin O'Connell is new, but I don't think he should overthink it. Like just game plan the same way where I'm interested in this mentality is just coming off of what happened against Indianapolis. I mean, the last big comeback when they had that was that emotional, they ended up losing 40 to three the next week to the Dallas Cowboys. Sure. So I am interested in that. Uh, there's also the part of like, I, you know, I think that this is, Interesting to see how they match up against a team that blitzes this much and just to get a feel for where these two teams stand against each other. Because like you've said is on paper, I think a lot of people that look closer into the numbers would say these two teams are closer than you think. Um, I, I think we would agree that maybe the Vikings have some more talent with someone like Justin Jefferson with that unstoppable weapon, but it's not like the Vikings have played, uh, you know, to the level of their competition. They played down to the competition in a lot of cases. So I think this will be a really interesting test for them. And then, hey, if they match up in the playoffs, uh, a we can do this again, uh, which would be fun. <laughs> and then we can, and then we could talk about '97, the onside kick, and Randall Cunningham, or we could talk about what we call here '41 Donut uh, in the <laughs> NFC Championship game. So there's a little history between these two teams. There you go. So if that's not a beautiful segue and preview to what may come up in a few weeks, then. Once again, I don't know what would be more appropriate. He is Matthew Collar, who covers the Vikings for the Purple Insider. Matthew, greatly appreciate the time and the insight. Always good talking with you. And we look forward to Saturday's game between the Giants and the Vikings. Happy yeah, thanks holidays, so much Matthew. for having thanks. me, guys. Bye. Yep, thanks so much for having me. The Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app we thank matthew collar and the guys for giving a really nice in-depth preview of your minnesota vikings so now let's have our final portion of our podcast bob papa with his weekly sit down with giants head coach brian dable the giants on christmas eve take on the minnesota vikings as always we're joined by the head coach of the new york football giants coach brian dable and coach um just to rewind a little bit go back to that sunday night game against washington uh, your team has exhibited this all season long, this resiliency, overcoming adversity. And I think one of the things that was coolest about the game the other night is at the end of the game, when they knew that you wanted to run it, you ran it. And Saquon got, what was he averaging, like eight yards of carry on that drive. I had to make you pretty proud with the way your team handled that. Yeah, you know, we talk about that all the time. You know, these games are usually close in this league. And you know, at times you're going to have to be able to do that when they know it's coming. And it's the same thing if you're in a two-minute drive. You're going to have to be able to pass the ball when they know you're, you're going to pass it. So uh, it was a good drive. Like would have liked to finish it off with a touchdown, but you know, really good kick by Graham and uh, well executed for most of the drive. All right, speaking of close, uh, one possession games. you got the Giants. You guys have had 11 of them. Minnesota is 10-0 and 0 in one possession games. There really is an art, though, isn't there, Coach, to – teams learning how to win these type games isn't there it's not a, it's not a coincidence that both of you guys have winning records um and have played in these close games yeah you know when you watch their tape they're, they're making critical plays at critical times and that's a credit to their players and, and to the coaching staff of competing and playing for 60 minutes and and making those plays you know in crunch time Coach, let's let's talk about Minnesota and um, what they bring to the table and what you're going to have to deal with today in this football game. Offensively, um, they can hit you in a lot of different places, can't they? Absolutely, um, and they're, they're extremely skilled at the skill positions. Obviously, it starts with with number 18, Justin Jefferson, who you know they line up all over the field, and you know this guy's a special, special player. Um, you know, you can devote two people to him and, you know, Cousins is still going to look his way and he usually makes the play and, you know, they got a, a runner who can take it to the house. You know, so you saw that on the screen pass uh, against Indianapolis there. And, you know, anytime he's got the ball in his hands, you know, whether it's outside run, inside run, check downs, swing passes, um, he's a threat. Thielen has, has been a special player for a long time. And then obviously they acquired Hawkinson, who's a, an exceptional tight end that made the Pro Bowl. And, um, you know, their line does a good job, a bunch of first and second rounders. Uh, I'd say their go-to players, Darisaw, 71. You know, if they need some yards, they're going to they're gonna try to run behind him. So uh, an explosive offense. You saw that in the second half of, you know, you've seen it all year, but you saw it in the second half of Indianapolis where, you know, putting up that many points in, in just a half is, is pretty impressive. 
Then you go to the other side of the ball, and they get some guys that can get after the quarterback. I mean, Zadarius Smith's got 10 sacks. Daniil Hunter's got eight and a half. Um, Patrick Peterson seems like he's drinking from the fountain of youth with three picks this season. And then always Harrison Smith on the back end, and the two inside backers are pretty talented. No, they're uh... – you know, veteran defense and those edge guys are, are problems. Uh, both Hunter and Smith, um, they can create rush a variety of ways, and, and they also do a good job of, of setting edges in the run game. And I'd say, you know, their back end is is very opportunistic, um, smart, savvy, crafty, um, a, a good defense all the way around. Coach, um, you know, from the outside, like where we where we're sitting, not where you're sitting, um, you know, there's. You guys have eight wins. You actually can clinch a playoff spot this weekend with a victory and then a couple other things happening. Do you even bring that kind of stuff up with your team, or is it just so insulated that that is just something that doesn't even factor into the equation? I don't. Um, again, I try to be as consistent as I can for the team. And, you know, there's things that we need to try to hit each week to, to give ourselves a chance and, you know, focus on what we do during the week, our preparation, our practice habits, um, and then go out there and, and, and play with confidence um, on Sunday. Final question, Coach. Um, you know, you got two guys that made it to the Pro Bowl this year, Saquon Barkley and Dexter Lawrence. Just talk about the seasons that they've had, the leadership that they've provided, and the fact that you have two guys on your team going to the Pro Bowl. Yeah, I'm proud of those guys. They're, you know, two captains for us. And, you know, Saquon's done a good job for us, as has Dex all year. I, I think they're really good team players, and, you know, they'd be the first to admit that it doesn't help happen without the guys around them. But, um, you know, Dexter's done a good job all year of, of creating pressure in the middle part of the pocket, stopping the run, controlling the line of scrimmage, and, and Saquon's been very productive whether we run it or throw it. And um, I think they've both improved along the way. They have great attitudes, and they're uh, excellent team players for us. All right, a lot. I do have one more question. Um you know, it's a it's an indoor game. Um, you know, it gets pretty loud in that building. Can you replicate it enough um, to get your team prepared? And how do you do that? Yeah, well, we 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 try our best. Um, it's never exactly the same as the environment you're going to play in. Um, it's a it's a great atmosphere. The fans are are right on top of you. It's loud. Uh, so you know we've. We blare the music, the crowd noise, as loud as we can during the week to, to make those guys have to communicate uh, during practice and simulate it the best we can. And then just run the football and score, and, and that'll keep them quiet, right? Yeah, the more, the more you can do that, the, the better it is. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been there before. I've coached there before, and uh, it's a great environment, and, and their team is 11-3 and three and, you know, on top of their division and, you know, close to being on top of the NFC. So, uh, tremendous challenge for us. Uh, first and foremost, the players that they have to compete against, the, the scheme from the coaches, and then you add the, the crowd, the third element. It's a, it's a very challenging game. Coach, we appreciate a couple minutes. Best of luck today, and Merry Christmas to you and your family, and we'll do it again next week. Same to you, Bob. That's Giants head coach Brian Dable. We thank him and Bob Papa, Lance Meadow, Paul Dottino, and Matthew Collar, and, of course, Kayvon Thibodeau for being our guest today on the Giants Huddle Podcast. Don't forget, go subscribe to Draft Season. It's really gearing up here. We're pretty much going to go every week from here on out as we break down some of the draft prospects that are declaring for the NFL Draft and, you know, who might be of interest to the Giants as they try to continue to build out their football team after the season is over. A lot of this is about team building still, folks. So Draft Season is a great place to to come on and talk about it. We thank everyone for being with us. The John Soto Podcast is brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy Hanukkah for those of you celebrating that. For those of you celebrating Christmas this weekend, Merry Christmas to you. And we'll see you next time on the John Soto Podcast.